Hello, everybody. Welcome to Politics in the Pub. My name is Mitch Burkett. I'm a coordinator with Communify. We're delighted to see so many people who are interested in this topic and who are prepared to come out on a very hot Tuesday night. We've got a fantastic topic um, on tonight and a wonderful panel. Um, it, it is a hot topic. Um, it is a hot night. And um, let's just keep it cool and respectful. Rebecca will talk more about the rules for engagement. Um, but yes, I'd just like to say that. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening, the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. New Farm Neighbourhood Centre hosts politics in the pub four times a year, and at each event, we address a contemporary issue important to the community of Brisbane. Our next event will be on Tuesday, May the 7th, same time, same place, and uh, short odds are on it being an election special. <laughs> We're grateful for the generous support of our hosts, Brisbane Powerhouse, and for the committee of volunteers who make politics in the pub happen. Our panelists and MCs are volunteers and receive no reward for their participation. We would like to thank the patrons of New Farm, whose financial support goes towards our community's most vulnerable and who also sponsor these events. Um, Jen Egan is here tonight. Jen, can you say wave? If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about uh, the patrons program, Jen is always up for a chat. Uh, also thanks to our sponsor, My Village News, the most read local paper for the New Farm Peninsula. Whilst we receive amazing support for this event, there are still unavoidable costs that we have to meet. You can support the event by purchasing a badge from the table at the entrance or by making a donation through the Communify website. If you'd like to find out more about our work in the community and about the New Farm Neighbourhood Centre, please talk to our team after the event. I'd like now to introduce you to our MC, Rebecca Livingston, who is the host for Mornings on ABC Brisbane. Rebecca. Hello, hello. Rebecca grew up in North Queensland and for many dedicated years was sure her future lay in ballroom dancing or on the netball court. <laughs> Fortunately for us, those careers didn't pan out and journalism beckoned. <laughs> Rebecca has asked many a question on statewide evenings, ABC Brisbane Drive, weekends, breakfast, and now she hosts the sensibly timed mornings on ABC Brisbane where she has an in-depth look at local current affairs issues. On this morning's show, she brought us analysis of what's happening on Manus Island, the mini explosion of micro wineries, discussed weird rashes and allergies, shooks in parliament and had a chat to Stephen Miles and put some hard questions to Adani. Wow, you were listening. <laughs> and that was just this morning. <laughs> when she's not at work, Rebecca explores in-depth issues with her two young boys who must be amongst Brisbane most, Brisbane's most informed kids. And somehow, fortunately for us, Rebecca finds time to contribute to community conversation. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Please welcome Rebecca Livingston. <laughs> wow. To be honest, just to give you an insight into my parenting, much to my seven-year-old son's joy, I said, you can watch something on TV, I've got to prepare for something on masculinity. So he spent the afternoon watching Pokemon, so that's where my parenting skills are at. Ladies and gents, so good to see you here. This is, this is huge. Last time we were here, we had this packed, and the sides packed, and a lady fainted there. I don't think we had anyone up the back, so hooray! <laughs> For you guys in the nosebleed section, I don't know, is it, is it masculine or feminine to sweat? Uh, I'm doing it right now. Who cares? It's human, <laughs> right. And it's what we're going to do tonight because um, we all want to be drinking cool drinks. I found out recently that um, hot drinks can get you into some awkward gender territory. This is Jessica on Twitter. I just heard a grown man change his order from a hot chocolate to a coffee because his other grown man friends teased him for his embarrassing order. <laughs> what the f <laughs> Toxic masculinity? Have you gendered hot chocolate? <laughs> so a bunch of people respond. And then she goes on, oh my God, another man at the table said he wanted a milkshake. And the whole table roared when another man said, are you ordering off the kids menu? This is ridiculous. You should be able to get a milkshake, you silly poor men. And then Katsu came in with a sensible observation. She said, milkshakes are delicious. These men must hate joy and are way too self-conscious about their delicate masculinity. 
I don't know if we're going to define masculinity or milkshakes tonight, but let's hope we all come away better human beings as a result of this conversation. You can see that the milkshakes have brought all kinds of boys and girls to the yard, which is a good sign so far. Let me introduce you to our panellists. Elijah Bowl is here. He's a criminologist, a youth advocate of the South Sudanese Australian community, and he came here as an unaccompanied minor refugee to Australia. Elijah has won more awards, I think, than any of us are going to win in our lifetime, uh, including Queensland Local Hero of the Year, and recently he's been given an Order of Australia medal. Please welcome Elijah. And so you don't get overwhelmed with the awesomeness of the panel, I'm going to ask each panellist the same question to kick off tonight. Elijah, can you tell us about a main man in your life? Thank you very much. Uh, the main man in my life uh, was my dad, although I haven't spent much time with him uh, at the age of 11, but I think he was the starting point. It was the starting point. All right, we're gonna learn more about your dad and his influence tonight. Alongside Elijah is David Dury-Smith. David is a development fellow in the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ. He researches masculinity, violent extremism, armed conflict, and violence prevention. And his book, Masculinities and the New Wars, The Gendered Dynamics of New War, was published in 2017. David, welcome. Can you tell us about a man in your life? Yeah, sure. I mean. For me, again, it's going to be the cliche of my dad, and because he is just the most beautiful failure at masculinity that I've ever met. <laughs> he is the most awkward, unphysically assured, caring person, despite the fact that he's six foot four and looks like he would kick a door down. Wow, okay, I'm intrigued. We'll come back to um, a beautiful failure of masculinity. Molly Dragowitz is here tonight too, ladies and gentlemen, an Associate Professor in the School of Justice, Faculty of Law at Queensland University of Technology. Molly is the author of Abusive Endings, Separation and Divorce, Violence Against Women. Molly, tell us about a main man in your life. Uh, I'm going to go off the track a little bit and talk about my grandpa, so not very far off the track, but my grandpa was a very important man in my life just because of the unconditional love that he provided me. Thank you, Molly. And rounding out tonight, Stephen Oliver is here, ladies and gentlemen. He's trained as a dancer, actor, singer. Wannabe singer. <laughs> Wanna be singer? At the Aboriginal Music Theatre Training Program and at WAPA. He's a published playwright and poet. He's lauded in the theatre world in which he works now. I'm sure you've seen his work on television or on the internet, as many millions of people have. Stephen Oliver, a privilege to have you on the panel tonight. Can you tell us about a man in your life? Oh, um. There's going to be tears. Um, uh oh. But I recently lost my best mate. Uh, uh, sorry. I think I've, just, I've moved past the Nile part. But um, yeah, he, he, he was interesting when it comes to talk about masculinity. Um, I guess it's funny, I just remember the night I tried to get him to say femininity and he, he couldn't. But um, it came around for a minute. <laughs> but um, I'll just tell you a quick story about him. We were at the Wickham. Um, one year, and another friend of ours got very drunk. And a friend, as you know, a lot of people are when they're very drunk, they get um, very annoying. And um, <laughs> anyway, my mate, he was holding our friend's beer in one hand, and he had chapstick in the other. So um, our friend said, you know, he snatches the beer off Rob, and he goes, "Give me my beer." And so Rob with the beer, and then the, the chapstick. This is what he actually does. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that's uh, someone very important in my life, yeah. So a fighter and a chapstick lover. And a chapstick lover, yes. <laughs> Those two things can exist. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Let's go to the Gillette ad, shall we? I don't know if you're aware, there was an ad for Gillette razors. And if you, depending on the era you, you grew up, I reckon most people in here would probably remember the original Gillette, the best a man can get. 
Thanks yeah. for leaving me alone on that, you want to be singer. You could have come in at that point. <laughs> the best a man can get. What is the best a man can be, David? Um, probably to be unmanned and to reject dominant expectations about how he should behave. The, all this messaging that we have, I think with the, the new Gillette ad annoys me almost as much as the original model because <laughs> instead of saying the best that a man can get is this incredibly static, hegemonic, heterosexual model of masculinity, it offers you an avenue to purchasing not only your manhood but your reformation from the damage that manhood wreaks onto men and boys. And through a kind of capitalist buying culture, it at the same time gives you your damnation and your freedom. And I just frankly don't buy corporate feminism on that stuff. Elijah, do you think men are given too many instructions, slipped into a razor packet perhaps, too many instructions on how to be a man? Yes, uh, uh, I guess one of the, the, the things that men are uh, becoming so fearful of, of how to define who they are is that there's this narrative and notion of which uh, some of the men are doing things that are unmanly. And, and that has caused that challenge for men to sometimes feel that they are being disadvantaged in a way and generalized in a term. And of course, because of the rise of uh, feminism and activists, actually that changed the narrative and caused men to fear to be judged in the society. And I think that's one of the big, biggest challenges that we are facing as men, and, and hopefully it's a narrative that needs to be revisited. Molly, how would you define masculinity? I would define masculinity as the clump of cultural expectations that we heap on top of people that are identified as men. And I would say that it varies over time and also from place to place and also just in your community and in your circle of friends. Do you think women are given the same clump of expectations and uh, instructions as well? I think we have a different clump with quite different characteristics. And I think that's part of the problem that Elijah and Dave have mentioned already. Stephen, how would you define masculinity? Oh. That, yeah, it, it's funny. I was, I was thinking about it before. Um, and even as a gay man, I've, I've heard a lot, but even you know, straight men to each other, that, that phrase about act like a man. I don't know if I've actually ever heard women say to each other, act like a woman. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and it, I, I just found that interesting. But, it, you know, even that word masculinity, like, I try to think if there was a, you know, in, in Aboriginal languages, whether it was a word for masculinity. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had, like, men's business and women's business. But there was no thing about, yeah, this thing of, of masculinity. I, yeah, it's bizarre. So can you just unpack men's business and women's business a bit more then? What does that mean? Oh, well, I mean, we just had, you know, business that men would discuss as men, and that was, that was part of the makeup. And same with women, you know, and we didn't get in each other's business about that because that was solely each other's business. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and I think that's, that's kind of interesting in that sense too because I think maybe we need to go back even to a bit of that because I think you need gay business, you need straight business. You, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of that where we don't talk about within ourselves about what it is that we want. Like, I, I think we need, we need to kind of discuss that a bit and say, okay, well, this, this is what we're facing. How do we deal with this? And, you know, even with masculinity, it's interesting watching that Gillette ad because you've got men going, oh, this is good, this is great. Then you've got men going, uh, we don't act like that or I'm not like that. And it's kind of stuff, well, how about we just get all those men together and sit around and then men talk about it and then sort it out. Yeah. David, you used the term uh, to describe your father as a, a beautiful failure of masculinity. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that, I mean, again, the term masculinity is really slippery, right? Because it can be used to refer to my experiences embodied as a man, or it can be used to idealised ideas of what a man should be, but no men actually are. Or it can be used as a description for how most men 
behave. And we tend to use it interchangeably in a way that doesn't really make sense. When I said like beautiful failure of masculinity, what I meant is that he, my dad's pretty far on the, the spectrum, on the autism spectrum, and it means he doesn't get a bunch of social cues. And so he doesn't necessarily always understand that he's making people really uncomfortable about things that he's talking to them about and about the way that they've acted that might have hurt him or about things that he cares about. And I just found that the most wonderful failure about how men are socialised that we should behave, that we should be stoic, that we shouldn't express our feeling. And certainly we shouldn't express our feeling physically to other men without screaming no homo and pretending that there's no sort of intimacy there. Mm. And I just think that for, for my dad, the most wonderful thing was he is just amazingly oblivious to how other people view him as not living up to the expectations of how a man should behave. Mm. And that's, to me, quite inspirational. Stephen, do you equate or come across people who equate masculin masculinity with homophobia? Um, yes, but it's interesting. I think those people who are most loudest about it are usually the ones who kind of have all this hidden, yeah, like it's, they're the ones who want it the most, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the louder you are, the more noise you make about it, the more you want it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I do find it. Molly, what do you reckon... Um, what are the positive aspects of masculinity? What are, the, what are the traits associated with masculinity, do you think, that regardless of, of gender or cultural expectations, that people would broadly applaud? Well, I think there's a lot of characteristics associated with stereotypical masculinity that are really positive ones, like being rational and solving problems and um, being decisive, being assertive, communicating what you want. Those are all really qu um, positive qualities as people. And I think one of the things that we talk about when we talk about critiquing um, gender stereotypes is this idea that there's positive qualities on both the masculinity side and the femininity side and I think we'd all like to have some from both. Mm. So, so why do you say with some sarcasm is, if I can describe it as that being rational, being assertive, is that because sometimes when women display those characteristics they're described as being like a man? Well, can anyone in the audience think of any word that we call women that do those things too much? I can think of one that rhymes with bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> How would you describe toxic masculinity, Elijah? Uh, to me, I think it is that Masculinity in its own definition is sometimes very controversial. And it defines who defines it. And that's one of the challenges we have. And, and it, it becomes toxic in a way that we are focusing on the, the negativity of what attributes uh, men bring into that uh, context. And to me, toxic uh, masculinity is this ideal where men become more survivors in a way that they adopt strategies of which are not useful or acceptable in the current uh, dynamic environment we're in. And, and that tended to become a toxic in terms of the activities we do, domestic violence of which men will say, I'm strong, you know, you got, you got a list. I, I heard some of the things that sometimes men will say to their partners that don't talk to me like that, I'm a man. What does that mean? And that turn it becomes so toxic in a way. Mm. Well, Molly, that probably goes back to your area of expect ex expertise, that idea of don't talk to me like that, I'm a man. When a man is violent, what is he trying to say or display? Mm. Well, Lots of men use violence against other men and against women for a whole bunch of different reasons. But I think you're talking about in the context of domestic violence, 
there's some really common dynamics where uh, men who are abusive to their partners, whether they're male or female, are often trying to reassert control that they feel like they're losing in the relationship. So it's actually, like you were just saying, it's an example of this feeling like you're letting, um, letting this slippery concept of being a man slip out of your hands, and violence can be a way to reassert that. Dave, you've looked at uh, masculinity and violence in the context of conflict and yeah. war. How does conflict shape masculinity? It's, it's both ways, right? So I would say that militarism and military institutions shape masculinity to prioritise values like brotherhood, like assertive violence in response to threat, like protection of the weak. And then on the same time, it depends on where the conflict happens, but so for my thesis, I did a bunch of work on South Sudan, and one of the effects of, of the conflict in South Sudan was that a bunch of practices that were associated traditionally with masculinity, like induction to manhood through an age set, became taken over by the, the Sudan People's Liberation Army and became part of your induction into the military. So for you to become a man, you have to go through military training in a lot of instances, particularly in the refugee camps on the border, and then to be a man becomes completely conflated with being a military man and being violent. But again, to, to what Molly said earlier, these dynamics, they really differ. And what military masculinity and, and conflict-related masculinity means in South Sudan is quite different to what it means in Timor-Leste, which is quite different to what it means in Australia. And in, in that space, I would really encourage people to not overemphasize the versions of masculinity that might appear to you to be visibly toxic. And we have a tendency to in particular, I'm thinking in Australia, identifying refugee communities, young men who are manifesting forms of masculinity that are really visible and saying, look at these problematic young African men who are violent and come from violent places. They have a t corrupted, toxic form of masculinity. Instead of what I would say is that masculinity is usually a reflection of structural conditions in the context where you come from. And the damage that's done, for example, by Australian military masculinity is less visible to us but it still exists. It's things like military men having very high suicide rates and having problematic relationships with alcohol consumption and with willingness to access medical services and care. So conflict-related masculinities might mean the use of public violence in gangs after war ends, but it also very likely will mean that military personnel will be less likely to care for themselves because that will appear to be weak or not tough enough. Do you have a sense that the, the military is getting better at addressing those kind of issues? Because that, the conversation around, around that is not new in this country. Is it improving? Look, I would say yes. I mean, Australia is in its second attempt to have a women, peace and security agenda, our national action plan on the topic to try and be more gender sensitive in relation to gender issues. But what I would say is the conversation around masculinity is really early. Women activists have only just got women on the table as a topic that matters in relation to the security sector. We are miles away from having a much more complicated conversation about what the military does. And part of it is just a basic tension that militaries are designed to train people so that they are willing to kill people they don't know on command. That has an impact on your masculinity pretty widely. And that is something which is going to be quite hard to reform in a gentler, more caring way when the main purpose of the institution is still to kill people you don't know. Mm. Um, we've just spent $50 billion on submarines. The Prime Minister spent an hour at the National Press Club yesterday. Uh, I don't know if many of you caught it. Did you, did you catch much of the Prime Minister's speech yesterday? It was quite frightening. It was all about security, your personal security, the threats uh, from international spaces, uh, the threats from asylum seekers. I, I wonder what your reaction was to that, given the correlation you've made between ramped up sort of yeah. military status there. So this is part of what I've done in research in the past on good or, or respectable masculinities in international relations. And what I would say is that the manifestation of masculinity from someone like Scott Morrison to me is much scarier than someone like Tony Abbott or Putin. Because with Tony Abbott and Putin, their masculinity is on display much more aggressively on their shoulder. So you can see the way in which the fact that Tony said he wanted to go shirt front Putin impacted policy. <laughs> Instead, when it comes to Scott Morrison, but certainly even more so with Malcolm Turnbull, the militarism is done in a very polite, 
acceptable way that makes it seem like it's not toxic in a masculine sense. But the identity there is still all about protection discourses and the need to be strong and protect our borders and protect our country from foreign invaders. And I, I think that really when we're looking at what masculinities, I don't like the term toxic masculinity, but what masculinities are harmful to our society, the ones I'm most afraid of are corporate, are political, are dominant. They're not the masculinity of an angry teenager in the inner city. They're the masculinity that are in our parliament every day, shouting women down, abusing people, trying to get their way and spending $50 billion on subs that we don't need. <laughs> Ladies and gents, I, I won't hog the, the depth of uh, knowledge and insight on the panel tonight. In around about 15 minutes' time, you'll have the opportunity to, to throw lots of questions at the panel. I think there's a, going to be a couple of microphones floating around. So if, as you're hearing responses, it's sparking ideas or questions in you, please save them up because we'll have about an hour of, of Q&A to, to go back and forth uh, respectfully this evening. Uh, Elijah, when you... Uh, when you hear of circumstances, this is a, a point I was, I was trying to discuss with my listeners today, an, an irony that I, I thought existed in um, what, is, what has turned out to be an historic day, perhaps a hypocrisy. On the day that Australia is cheering the return of one refugee, Hakim Al-Arabi, we timed it. People tracked his flight coming into Australia. It was almost like a hero's welcome. It was like, what a great country we are. On the same day, the debate in, in Canberra centred around how to keep another group of men out of the country. Is that a display of masculinity and strength? Is that about security? And I wonder, as you straddle you know, different worlds of, of cultural uh, influence how you see that playing out is it hypocrisy or is it just you got to be strong in some areas and and cheer a refugee in others yeah I think as Dave mentioned it's around that toughness uh, we've got to be tough to to protect our borders but again in that toughness our politicians sometimes tend to pick out of that toughness pick what apple they want and I think that's the danger that uh, is forcing us into the conversation that uh, that bureaucrats in, in a term and our politicians are making policies that sometimes tend to divide us. So to me, the messages that are coming out saying, okay, we welcome this, then we don't want this, to me is, in a, in a way, is assertiveness of pushing that uh, masculinity in a way that we are who we are and we can accept who we want and we can reject who we want in that sense of saying I'm tough, we're strong and we have to exert our strengths mm. to protect whatever, prevent whatever is coming in. And I think that's where we lost the sense of what humanity is because masculinity in its way, it got some good aspect of it. And I think being honored being caring is some of the aspects that some men do have, and I think we are losing those good elements of masculinity in the way we react, in the way we create fear, in the way we communicate our messages, and that's where it becomes so difficult in terms of how we do that. And, and interestingly, these are the men who are saying those things. So it's interesting what character do they have as David alluded to, you know, we've got three leaders and they actually differentiate them very well. Some of them are very visible, but some of them are now coming up with that sense of, I'm a man, I'm a leader of this country, I've got to be tough, and I can pick whoever I want and whoever I don't want. And I think it should be embraced. If we come back to the positive of masculinity, then we need to take care of everyone. Mm. It should be noted too that both uh, Scott Morrison and Bill Shorten went to church this morning before Parliament sat as well, which I thought was an interesting twist in the mix as well. <laughs> Molly, are weak men violent men? Nah. <laughs> I think it is complicated. I think that uh, sometimes that's a stereotype that we have is that, you know, the people that are violent are people that are weak on the inside. And I think that violence, like I said, gets used for a lot of different reasons. 
And I think that we all have aspects of weak and strong inside of us. So I don't think you can make those kind of blanket state statements about who uses violence. People use violence for legitimate reasons of survival, just like they use it for controlling and domination purposes. And you really have to look at the context of what's happening to understand what it, what it really means, I think. Often um, discussions of toxic masculinity and, and rape culture uh, become prevalent after a violent attack. And we've seen that play out in, in Australia of the, uh, certainly in the last couple of months. What do you see as the interplay then between gender and violence? Well, as an American, I have a president right now that sort of embodies that link. I think that uh, the relationship between gender and violence is that the way that women and men are socialized shapes the types of violence that we do or don't do and when we do it and who we do it to. So gender really heavily shapes how violence comes out. And like, like I said, it really depends on the community that you're in. The triggers for violence are different from culture to culture and across time. Um, so I, I really like this idea that focusing on one gender masculinity or femininity, you know, it, it might be nice to go back to this idea of being humanist and protecting everyone. Stephen, I had a conversation with a friend uh, recently who was lamenting that in her uh, gay community, the desire for straight acting men seemed to be prevalent. Is that something that you've seen, or is that just in my friend's friendship circle? Oh, uh, yeah, no, that, that really annoys me. Um, it's funny, you know, whenever I see gay men describe themselves as straight acting, I'm like, you're doing gay pride wrong. <laughs> um, you know, but even this thing of, like, they're giving into the Smith that all gay men are camp. So it's the thing of, like, well, masculinity isn't exclusive to s straight men. Masculinity isn't ex even exclusive to men. But we throw this thing around that only straight men act a certain way. Mm. So, yeah, that's quite, you know, it's frustrating. So it's kind of, it's, it's making defined roles for both gay men and straight men at the same time, if you say... Well, yeah, well, it is. I mean, but it's even, you know, and it's, am I allowed to swear? Yeah. But it's interesting. Well, Molly said bitch, when I was, so yeah, she started I it. I kicked it out. No, no, but I'm going to be F word, so I'm dropping an F one. But it's interesting because I've had, you know, these straight acting, you know, gay men on the scene and then they'll say to me, I'll oh, act like a fucking man. And when I throw back at them and I go, well, what the fuck are you going to do about it? They're like, ooh, they don't know how to act all of a sudden mm. because this man who's supposed to be camp as doesn't act how they expect me to act. So when I throw it back into their face, they go into this, oh, what do I do now? You know, yeah. so that's, is, yeah. Do you think there's, it's more prevalent at the moment to have that kind of straight acting trend that, that translates into desirability? And if so, does that seem strange to you, given that um, gay rights have been recognised in more practical terms recently? Yeah, well, I just find it, like, I go, whenever I see that, I'm like, do you know how stupid that sounds like? Because imagine if, if, you know, I'm like, imagine if straight men went around gay acting. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, yeah, it, I don't know. That, to me, that's just, you know, a thing within themselves. And it's still that, it's that self-loathing thing that I find. That's what it actually is. They haven't come to terms with their sexuality and they believe they need to play to this idea of what a man is. Um, and to them, they still have this thing that being a gay man means that they're not really a man. So they have to call themselves straight acting. Do you think men are confused, Dave? <laughs> no, I don't think they're confused. I think men are given contradictory messages by society. And that society is structured intentionally in a way to give men messages that you will inevitably fail to achieve. Masculinity is a failed project before you've begun. And that is partly, for example, how we get young men to take dangerous, high-risk jobs for low money to prove that they're butch enough. And that's how that we organise labour and exploitation and a whole bunch of other things. And I don't think that masculinity is like confusing. I think it's contradictory and it's inherently contradictory. And those contradictions show themselves more or less depending on the context that you're at. So in a context like now where you no longer have the option to get a secure lifelong job if you work hard, play butch and go to university, 
that is difficult for young men in a way that it wasn't for a previous generation. But that's not because masculinity is confusing, that's because masculinity is structured to get them to still go do that work, even though they're not going to get rewarded for it. Mm. Elijah, in your work um, in, within the South Sudanese community within Australia, what's the impact on young men in particular when they are tagged as violent, when they are tagged as the other, when they are tagged by the, the Prime Minister as something to be frightened of, and Christopher Pine when he was reminded to be frightened of those gangs? Yeah, a, a lot of young people from different diverse backgrounds and refer to African young people, they are in, not only in the crisis of masculinity, but also in, in the crisis of identity. And why do I say so? Is that these young people came from a different culture, as David alluded to, sometimes masculinity could be defined based on the environment you're in, based on the culture you, you come in. And they are in crisis of first identifying their manhood. You know, in their culture, it could be different how men are perceived. And some cultures, for example, in my own culture, and that's why I mentioned my dad, is that man is a head of the family. And then now, how do you translate that if you're aggressive men? You know, you gotta make sure everyone understands your order. But if you are a humble man, a caring man, you'll say, that's not how I apply it. I'm here to care for everyone. So that's one of the crises that young people are having, the cultural identity of, to define their own, in their own culture, who they are. And also, they are in an environment which is very, you know, progressively, you know, creating confusions on masculinity. Mm. And that's a, another factor why young people are acting the way they are. And then it comes social issues that they are going through, and it's, it's another factor that has come upon them. So when I hear people talk of integration, I would say, look, integration often in different dynamic, it doesn't need to be positive, it could be negative. So if I go, you know, steal a car, and I know there's a law in Australia that punish both those people who still think that part of integration, by the way, because I'll end up in the jail down there. But again, if I do positive thing or do something by myself, it's also part of integration. So these young people are just confused by the dynamic that they find themselves in. Mm. But actually, and that's the only thing we need is to actually hold their hand and say, okay, you are here, this is how we want you to go. And also come back to cultural aspect of it. The challenges we have mus with masculinity is that the Western way of defining it may not fit other culture that are not defined in the Western context. Mm. Also, another challenge is masculinity as a defined so far by advocates who, who push for feminism, for example. And they actually define what feminism is, and that has scared a lot of men. And that's why I say earlier, men are trying to say, I need to survive in this environment, and when they did that innocently, it's just a matter of because they lost that sense of survival. So that's why you see a lot of young people are in a lot of those crises. But I think defining them as a gang, it doesn't fit the context. Mm. I think they should just be said, these are young people who are confused and they need support. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, Stephen, who has three sons who is sort of mainstream Australians, and he, his theory is that young men need a time to be taken away to be with their father in particular um, and to do some kind of activity that may involve shooting pigs, camping, uh, making a fire, that kind of thing. He says he's developed that within his own family as a tradition to say, come on, it's time for you to become a man. Do you think there was a time when you became a man? I think I'm still becoming a man. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I, it's, I think, I think, you know, part of the problem is we live in a society where we send young men messages that getting a job, getting laid, getting drunk, getting into a fight, you know, these are the things that make you a man. And for me, that, that we're teaching young men being a man is all about getting. We're not teaching young men that part of being a man is about providing. You know, people think that you're a man if you scare people, when really you're a man if you make people feel safe. 
So I, I think that's what part of the problem, and it comes back to the capitalism, you know, that brother boy was talking about before, like, I had a debate with a mate of mine the other day who was very upset that they were taking the term, they, they were calling tissues not man-sized anymore. So he was, he was very, you know, why is there all this negativity in the world, why are they, you know, and I'm like, well, man, it's a tissue, like, <laughs> you know, it, 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 if you need a tissue to just define you, like, you know, I can't help you with that, like, that's, <laughs> You know, and, um, and bless him. But you know, and then afterwards, though, he said he said a very, very poignant thing. And he said, um, and I can't remember what it is that I said to him, but he said, "Yeah, you get it." He said that you know, men, you know, were sensitive too. So it came back to the, yeah, and and it, it is it's part of that. You know, we live in a society where we're telling if if you do if you go camping, if you get a four wheel drive, if you buy man big tissues, then you're a man. You know, so, and, and that's part of the problem, it is, and that we've been fed so many lies through consumerism that this, makes, this will make you sexy, this will make you a man, this will make you a woman, and I, I just think that's part of all, you know, the bigger problem. Mm. But it does show the kind of, the sensitivity of the debate though, doesn't it, that a tissue, whatever size tissue, can provoke quite a strong response in some quarters, um, and, and, you know, even further ramped up with the Gillette ad recently. Mm. Um, we're going to get to your questions very shortly, ladies and gents, so minutes away, rack them and stack them. I don't want to get to the very pointy end um, of this discussion. In Australia, men account for 75% of death by suicide. What do you think we can do as a, as a society, as a culture, to help lower that figure? I think we need to be more open uh, about it and, and what it is, what actual direction it is we're going. Um, you know, and this comes back to that society thing again. I think what we live in a society where we spend so much time trying to keep our heads above the water that we've forgotten that what we need to do is swim back to the shore. And now we're at that point where we're going, sorry, but we're going, we don't even want to put our hands on someone's out shoulder because we're frightened we're going to bring them under the water with us. So we go through so much worry, but we go, I don't want to talk to you about it because I know you've got your worries too. And you know, that, that's the, the kind of thing that we're, we're living in. And I'm sorry to go back to money again, but it, you, when you hear so much about talk about inequality and it's like, well, as long as we have this thing of, of money, we will never have equality. Because to have someone rich, you always have to have someone poor. Um, and I think that's, you know, what a lot of suicide comes from. And it, and it comes back to that thing of being a man, of going, you have to do this, but then you can't do that. Like, so the thing about even providing for a family. I've seen men who go, who can't get a job, who can't find a job, and they feel worthless. Yeah. And they're going, I'm not a man, I've got a family, I'm not protecting them. Um, so, more emotional than I thought, but, um, you know, I, I think we need to go, we go back to a lot of that, but then we also need to look at with the 75% of men, because that thing of young footballers, who were, a lot of them were killing themselves, because they, they weren't making it, they had these dreams of getting into the, the NRL, and they don't make it, so they were taking their lives. The, the thing about with military, I was talking to, to a, uh, you know, a guy who came back from like, Afghanistan, um, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, he got two days, he had a two day course to help him readjust back into society. Two days, and I'm like, and he's like, yeah, they were like yeah, eight hour days, and he had that. I, I talked to another guy who, who was, you know, head of his command, and he, he saw his, his whole team get blown up in front of him, and he saw these bodies, and I'm like, no one should have to see that. You know, but then we also, you need to look at, you know, the indigenous suicide rates, like Aboriginal people, Aboriginal men in between 25 and 29 per capita, were the highest suicide rate in the world. For men, like that, that you know, but then you, you get like even trans men, mm. you know, trans youth, um, gay men who are constantly, I, I've lost so many friends on the gay scene who have taken their lives. I, you know, I watched a video of me when I used to be a backup boy dancer <laughs> in my little cute sexy shorts, but um, <laughs> there were four of us who were backup boy dancers and we've lost two of those boys to suicide. And, it, and it's, it's crazy and, and we need to be going you know, we have a real problem. And when you live in an individualistic society where you're taught to look out for yourself, that's kind of the thing as well, is that 
people, like I said, we're, we're so, we're, we feel like we're drowning, we just can't take anyone else's worry on. And it's like even this thing now when I'm going through with my best mate, and I feel like, you know, I want to I ring people, but then I go, you know, the, I know that they've got their own shit as well. So, um, mm. yeah, that was a bit of a tangent, <laughs> a lot of stuff there, but. That's, mm. but it's really important to talk about, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, Molly, what about the right to be a man, to be masculine? Um, I think some voices in this discussion say, the reason why men feel like they can't open up or they can't, they don't, you know, they're, they're being told how to do things or, or ways to act or, or, or things to say, but they also argue that men have a right to be a certain way. Do you think that by sometimes society giving so much feedback to men, it actually ends up being constrictive? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what you were just talking about. This, all these, um, these little gender boxes are so tight for everyone, and we waste a lot of energy trying to fit into our individual gender box. Like this morning, everything from the panties you put on to your hairdo and what you're wearing and whether or not you're wearing makeup and maybe even what kind of car you drive. All that stuff is really heavily gendered and we waste so much energy trying to fit into those boxes that we could be using to take care of our friends or support other people or protect people. So for sure, um, the, narrow, the narrow boundaries of masculinity have really obvious negative implications like suicide and not being willing to go to the doctor so you're more likely to have a heart attack and you know that the upshot is that men die earlier because of all those things. Mm. And, but the thing that we can remember is that, that that gap, the age expectancy, life expectancy rate, is very different in different countries depending on the structural equality that exists in those countries. So yeah, for sure, masculinity has some uh, restrictions involved. Elijah, do you feel comfortable in your circle of friends to open up and talk about your your feelings and your vulnerabilities? Because you're, you're in particular now held up also as a, a leader within your community. Yeah. It's challenging, it, it's tough. It's a tough conversation. Uh, in my culture, there are some aspects that you are considered as a man, you know, men don't cry, but I cry more than my wife, so I think that <laughs> that book is thick. But I often, I'm not fearful of creating a, a, a tough conversation on simple things that, you know, setting the agenda say, women can do what men does. And I think if we start discussing those, and that's what I tell, I challenge a lot of my men in my circle and say, look, it won't hurt in my culture, you, you are not allowed to be somewhere close in the kitchen where the woman uh, is become a woman business, but I don't think it's their business because at the end of the day, I'm going to eat that food. But, <laughs> but men are not allowed to go to certain, to the kitchen to see what the, the woman is cooking. But I challenge those narrative. I always, when there's event, I'm in the kitchen. And some men will join me and say, okay. So it's normalize that and say, look, it doesn't hurt to be a man but it also doesn't hurt to do what men don't do. And I think that's what the message we need to pass. And also, I think we need to create that generational gap. And I think that's the conversation we need to have in order to, to, to make men feel that they are not threatened in their own thinking, is to create that conversation within the family, within our circle, and tell our next generation group of young men and say, look, we are human, we, we need to care for each other, we need to respect each other, and I think when we say that, they will grow up knowing respect is important. It doesn't hurt, I think a lot of men sometimes will feel that the rise of feminism is, is, a, is bringing crisis to them, but to me I don't see it that way. It's actually creating a flaying field for everyone to have that equal say to have equal opportunity to care for each other without being dominant one. And I think that's the narrative I'm trying to challenge as a leader within my community 
but also it's a, something that we need to, to share. We need more education about acknowledging that there are some good aspects of men. And I think if we talk of those good, good aspects of men, they will open up more and they will share their challenges. Instead of committing suicide tonight, they will call a friend and say, hey, my, this is what is happening to me, and they may get help. Because this sense of notion of saying, men don't cry, you need to be strong, I think it become a history of the fast. Because we, the thing we are experiencing today, we didn't experience them in a few years back. And I think that's where we need to move to, if we really want to create that environment where men feel safe, where men feel, feel respected, where men feel heard, but also when women also feel they are not being dominated. And I think that's where we need to move the conversation to. All right, beautifully said. Thank you, Elijah. Some good fan technique going on in the audience. Is everyone okay? Keeping hydrated? I wish I bought this mine. Way. <laughs> Stephen wants some wine. Do you oh have my. some questions, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? We'll take wine. For our panellists. Do we have microphones, Kat? Yes. Oh, he's up the back. The hands are up. Who would like a microphone? Come on down. Oh, you're right in the fainting section, sir. Lady fainted over there last time, so be careful. Actually, it was a lady who was standing. Uh, yes. Three people on the back there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, stand up. What's your question? Uh, thank you. I'm on. Yep, thank you very much. Um, look, I found this evening's conversation really um, engaging and enlightening. Um, my question is around a comment that you made around politicians and going to church. Um, the, the immediate moment you said that, there was an immediate stereotyping of a group of people in our society in regards to masculinity and spirituality. Um, and there's a very strong connection between spirituality and sexuality, and I guess masculinity as well. Um, and so I know many people who have a deep faith spirituality who are great role models for masculinity, who are courageous, grace-filled, a whole mutual, whole range of stuff. And so my question is, how do we stop doing exactly the thing that we keep talking about tonight and not stereotyping people based on our own bias? And then what tools do we actually have to help us do that? Okay, I'll just jump in and first say so the reason I said that was because it was off the back of our discussion about uh, security and strength and, you know, that kind of show of uh, both political and, and international bravado. But I wanted to set the context of that as that just prior to that, that's what the two leaders did. But um, Elijah, Dave, you want to jump in on stereotyping and uh, how and if we should stop that? Yeah, uh, to me, I guess one of the fear uh, that uh, we have as men is that narrative that has been painted in the, the, the public mind of when what men has to say is sometimes can be misinterpreted. And that has caused a lot of fear. But in the context of us going to church, uh, and I'm a good church goer, and sometimes there are values that are very good in the church. We learn those values. But the challenge is for us, how do we translate those values to those who are outside the church? And I think the value we have in the church is all about caring for each other, looking after each other, forgive each other. And I think if our politician can translate that thing that we, they got in the church, no one even will talk about them because they will just normally be doing their job. But the moment we sort of chip away from who, what we believe to be, to do what we, doesn't reflect what we do, that's where you find a lot of stereotype and say, look, hang on, I've so, seen so-and-so praying yesterday in the church, but he's saying, I don't need them here. Keep them there in the prison where they belong. That's where stereotype coming. But if we, as men, be true to our values, then the society will be an equal place where everyone can share the same belief, can share the same environment, and also can help each other to prosper. And I think that's the narrative that I want us to look at that. You know, looking at my wife as someone who is a human being, and I need to care for her. Looking for someone who is not in the church to say, 
this is what I learned in the church, and I have to maintain that. And I think stereotyping will chip away from our vocabularies. Just on that, like, I think it's really important to distinguish between stereotypes and institutions. I, like, I grew up in the church. My dad's a minister who was born on mission in Papua. My auntie's a missionary. My uncle's a minister. My brother's a youth minister. My granddad was a minister. There's a lot of ministers. What are you? <laughs> Not one. <laughs> um, and I think that the, 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 the question of stereotypes is really important. You don't want to stereotype people in the church and there are for example, fantastic lesbian nuns who have been doing great work all over the world for a long period of time. But the church, at least in my experience with the Anglican church in Australia, does have structural institutions that privilege heterosexual masculinity, that embody compulsory heterosexuality, that denigrate femininity. I went to a church for a long time that would lecture to women in the sermons about not having masculine haircuts and not breaking from their godly um, images of how they were made and would talk to men about how they need to be real men. And the way that they fixed that is that they developed um, D-Day camps where men would go off and do martial arts and then study the gospel. They'd do mixed martial arts training, study the gospel so that they could learn how to be real husbands. And these things are not stereotypes. It's contradictory based on the church. And there are different institutions. The Uniting Church, for example, is quite different to the Anglican Church. But there are institutional structures here. And those institutions, for example, are relevant to how sex abuse scandals and masculinity and male authority have intersected in Australia. So not to be stereotyping, but I think we still need to have conversations about structures. And the church's complicity in bad masculinity is part of that. Oh. Can I just say too, I think, I think politicians though themselves also need to, to lead in that example of not stereotyping. I think politicians are very good at stereotyping. Uh, look at what we do with refugees. Uh, look at what we do with Aboriginal. Look at what Peter Dutton did with the Sudanese community. Um, or as Peter Slutton as I call him. But, um, you know, I, I think politicians, when it comes to that, I think, yeah, I think they should lead by example. And because um, they are meant to be the leaders of our countries. And so lead by example. All right. Go ahead. Uh, I think there's been a, a fundamental error in the socialisation process of males in our society. And that is that we identify maleness and being a man with masculinity, whereas, as we pretty much know, but seem to gloss over or forget, males uh, have both ma masculine and feminine characteristics, as do females. So really remembering that, that, that definition, I think it's important if we're going to look at the way forward in the evolution of how we see ourselves and identify as men in our society and how that changes over time. So my question really is, how do we make sure that we don't forget that and use that knowledge to really guide men and boys becoming men to become balanced and not, not buying into that toxic masculinity that has been so prevalent in the past? Molly? Well, I think that there's a really interesting paradox here where we really socialize girls and boys really hard, right? You go to the Target or the Big W and you walk down the toy aisle and the boy toys are like all about muscly dudes that shoot people in the face or whatever. And then the pink aisle where all the girl toys are, all the, oh, here's a baby you can feed, and never the two shall meet, right? So if you think about it, if these sex differences were the cause of these really rigid gender roles, we wouldn't really require all of that hardcore socialization. It would just sort of happen naturally. So I really like your point about this. It really is about, um, feminism is about, and all these challenges to this concept of toxic masculinity are really about opening up those rigid stereotypes so that we can be more full humans. And if you think about the generations before us, you know, in some ways things are moving forward and changing, but in other ways, like the standards for masculinity are getting ratcheted up. And um, if you talk to your own father, your own grandfather, or great grandfather, a lot of those guys wish they had more time with their children, closer relationships with their children, 
But they weren't allowed to do that because their job was to go out and make money or whatever. So I think that um, even the older generations that we think of as having those stereotypical views, they feel the loss from that rigid socialization. So um, I, don't, I don't know the answer about how we make that happen. I think having these conversations about what we really value is a huge first step. Um, I was, yeah, I was just reminded me before when I went and watched a, a documentary um, with a trans woman. Uh, you know, but I was saying before about, yeah, the thing of masculinity isn't exclusive to gay men, straight men, even just men. Um, and I think that, you know, even when we look at, as soon as we have a baby and we, we see a baby and we go, that's your gender, we give them a name. And then immediately when we give them that name, we set them into this thing of expectations of what they're meant to do with their lives or who they're meant to be. Um, and I think it's interesting, if you look at like some Native American societies, they actually had five genders. And I think that's part of the thing is that we need to expand our minds about what, when we say gender, what do we actually mean? And we go man, woman, and to say there's only two. And I find that very uh, a limited way of thinking, almost. And because nature shows us that variation you know, so why, why are we immune to that as human beings? So if you look at, look at the amount of sharks or the amount of types of ferns or, or that kind of stuff, why do we as human beings go, there's only man and woman and that's it? When there's not, because if you look at intersex people as well, and, and we, even then we try to define intersex people and say, oh, well, your characteristics are more of a man or your characteristics are more of a, of a woman. So I think there's things, you know, I think there's discussions to be had around going, is there actually more than two genders? All right, go ahead. Good evening. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I think the first thing I would like to say is that women on average are really, really tolerant of us guys. And I think they, they've got to be commended on average. <laughs> the second thing that I, I read a book called um, Bringing Up Boys by Steve Bidolf. I'll say that again, Bringing Up Boys by Steve Bidolf. It was really a, an excellent book. It filled in all the gaps of me as a young, as a guy of about 40, 45 years old. And when I read the book and the things that I was missing as a boy growing up, understanding myself as a male, understanding my, where I was in society, and just understanding being a male. So it's really a, a, a good book worth, worth um, taking note of. Thanks. Book club recommendations. We'll take them tonight <laughs> as well. Thank you. Actually, I just saw a, a Steve Bidoff just put on Facebook today um, uh, a little picture of, I think it was someone sort of trying to take a doll out of a little boy's hands. And it said, uh, the comment was, um, don't you let your son play with dolls. Aren't you afraid that dot, dot, dot. And Steve Bidoff had filled in He'll be caring, he'll be uh, considerate, he'll understand what it's like to, you know, have long hair or da da da, da all, those, all those kinds of things. So Steve Bidoff's twist on um, raising boys, raising girls is always irrelevant. Uh, yes, so wherever we are. It's a bit hard for us to see up here, so if we're all yeah. squinting a little bit. Waving around. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I wonder whether our importance on masculinity and femininity has been lost and we should be more focused on just teaching um, our young people to respect themselves rather than focus on all the other things that are around but to be respectful of themselves and to be comfortable in their own skin and I think with the um, your the angry Sudanese boys and our angry young people a lot of that is about been hurt young people and I think when we can teach them and help them to respect themselves then um, we'll have a much healthier society yeah yeah I yeah I totally agree with your uh, observation and I think and I think as a society what we need is first respect yourself because one of the characters of masculinity is honor, courageous, and all this stuff. So if you respect yourself, you will be honored. And I think if we communicate the language without putting women, you know, we don't even talk about 
feminine, uh, feminism and masculinity because I think it's getting to those simple basic that are needed for human being to, to live together. And I think that will really shape us uh, to a better future in discussing all this topic. That, can I just jump in? Let me be Piers Morgan for a minute. Mm -hmm. Piers Morgan would say, for goodness sake, this panel, you are you are rejecting what, the, what obviously exists in front of people. Let boys be boys, let men be men. What do you say to that, David? Before David, I think... <laughs> I, I, I think t people are not saying that we don't want boys to be boys. What people don't want is the action of what it meant to be a boy. And I think that we need to differentiate that. We can be boys as respectfully as we could, but make sure it is not harming the interests of vulnerable people. Yeah, look, I mean, I would say we do let boys be boys. That's why we're sick, sad, and unwilling to get help. I mean, we do let boys be boys. That's why we consider emotional closeness to make you a fag. I think we do let boys to be boys. That's why we bully people into killing themselves for being gender non-conforming in high school. And I mean, I, 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 I've heard the Piers Morgan angle of this over and over again, but I think the research on it's pretty consistent. The thing that makes men harm themselves, harm others, and be unsatisfied with the choices that make them do that is not because society is demonizing them for being boys. It's because it's encouraging them to. And when it comes again to this question of like self esteem and self-respect. I'm really worried about when we put this back down onto individuals about a kind of self-help ideology that you can just go out there and remake your personal masculinity and the world will be fixed. I saw a lovely meme about a year ago which was if Fifty Shades of Grey had been written about a guy in a trailer park it'd be a horror movie. And that's because it's not just about what you perceive. Masculinity is substantively about how you perform tropes about how men should behave. And lots of those are about you being white, rich, heterosexual, and well-educated and articulate, and having particular kinds of bodies. And it's not enough to tell men and boys to just buck up and believe in yourself and have self-esteem. It's about the way that our society ranks and privileges people on their performance of certain kinds of masculinity. And that is material, it is not just individual, it's structural, and that's why we have the same people in the same institutions. That's why we have the same people on billboards, and that's why we have the same people as our celebrities. And I, and I think self-respect, you know, obviously it is important, but I, you know, my family, what we were always taught, even with the most with other family members, is that you never, you know, um, you never think you're better than anyone else, but at the same time, never let other people think they're better than you. So, it, you know, it's that kind of thing is like, yes, we need that self-respect, but we also need to be learned about that, taught about respect for others. Um, and I think that's what's lost in a lot of the, you know, what I often make a joke about, you know, this thing about, but, you know, there's a seriousness behind it where you see all these, you know, advanced hair ads and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, well, if society couldn't make me feel bad for being black and gay, then none of you hair ads are going to make me feel bad for having no hair. <laughs> <laughs> As I wear a hat. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I, uh, I really appreciate the conversation about institutions and the logic that we have to kind of, that, that we're pushed to operate by. And I wonder if there's a certain masculine logic uh, that is distinct from a feminine logic and, and what, we've talked about um, stereotypes and I wonder if there's an underlying difference in logic that we are, where we're privileging, where we're privileging some things in a way that's different from the way that a feminine logic privileges things. Anyone want to jump in on that? I mean, I'm an unreformed, like, 70s feminist, so I think the <laughs> word we're looking for here is patriarchy. You know, it's the institution. And masculine logic, there's different masculine logics in different institutions. And there's a great scholarship, for example, about how caring masculine logics in police force lead to police undermining the authority and autonomy of women who are sex workers, for example. But the overarching thing here, I think, is not just about masculine or feminist broad logics, but about a societal structure of patriarchy. David, do you think there would be less uh, physical conflict in the world if there were more female leaders? That, that's proven. 
<laughs> I mean, Mary Caprioli has done this like positivist statistical analysis. Female leaders don't go to war. Female leaders don't increase their defence budgets. There are individual exceptions, right? But yeah, Ms. Margaret Thatcher, there's individual exceptions. But on the whole, when you have women in peace negotiations, they're more likely to hold. When you have women involved as CEOs, they're less likely to crash the company and be exploitative. Every time. And but that's not because of some inherent biological trait that women have. It's because men are socialised to take risky behaviour, to see conflict as valorous, and to see backing down as making you feminine, which is the worst thing a man could be. I, I totally agree with Dave. I think the society these days is training to accommodate those females who possess the character of a man. And, and I think women who stand up for men today are the ones who are getting into the politics, whether you like it or not. You look at our former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. She's able to stand up to the face of men. And I think that's the way they're heading, but we need to look at what others, you know, feminists who don't stand up for themselves. This, these are the people who are getting affected by that uh, narrative. Okay, who's got the mic? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Thank you so much for your contribution to all of you. I'm really like learning a lot from all of you tonight. I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I guess I wanted to ask a question because um, at the moment I'm a social worker, uh, my partner is a trans man, um, and I am constantly confronted with um, men's violence against women. I'm constantly confronted with those really toxic forms of masculinity that come through my door and I'm having to deal with on a daily basis. Um, as well as men not wanting to talk about mental health or I'm finding it quite difficult to engage with men who are wanting to seek help but don't know how to. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how we can start having those conversations on that individual basis because I think a lot of the conversations we're having at the moment is very like broad ranging and I guess talking about society but I sort of want to get a bit more insight on that sort of one-on-one -on -one kind of how we can challenge that. Molly, can you speak to that? Well, I think that the most difficult place to start and also the most convenient is with the people that we know in our individual interpersonal relationships. And any of you that's ever been to a holiday at your family's house <laughs> knows that those conversations can be like the most emotionally taxing, shall we say. But really, if we're not having these conversations with our own families and our own friend groups and confronting things that we're not liking in those groups, it can be, um, you know, it's one thing to preach at people out there, but I think we need to start in our own relationships. And it, it's easier said than done. Um, the, your family might be one situation, but uh, going to work, there's all those structural traditions, shall we say, that make it really difficult to have those conversations at work. But um, yeah, I think we have to start in our own interpersonal circles for sure. How do you though get someone to, in the instance of this um, woman as a social worker, get someone to open up, talk, expose themselves, be vulnerable, uh, talk about feelings if, if they've been conditioned to, to not do that. I don't know if anyone can, any of you can speak from either personal instances or from a, a, I guess, a broader sort of psychological perspective. How do you get someone to, to open up and admit to their, their feelings or failings if they don't want to? I don't know. I'm fine. I have a personal experience with that at the moment where I'm finding that really hard. And it, it's, it's, it hurts me because I know the way they act is because they're so hurt. But every time I try to talk about it, I can't get anywhere, it always goes back to the same thing. And I think it's just that, I know it's the default. It's, it's the only way they know how to respond or react to things. Um, so I mean, me personally, I, I'm at a loss for that. I thought of trying to say things where I word it, where I'm just going, where I'm talking, I'm feeling hurt. I'm, so because I know that the moment I will go you, then things will explode. But even then, if, if I go, you know, I'm, the, you know, because I asked them, I actually said to them, I said, why do you hate me? And the message I got back was, I don't hate you, you're my big brother, I love you. And I said, well, I'm trying to fix things with you. 
And I said, but I just don't know where to go with that. Um, so I mean, you know, me myself, I have no idea how do you, you go about that, but at the same time, I, you know, I kind of went, now I know you're just trying to hurt me. And so I, you know, I haven't spoken to them in a couple of years now, because it's that kind of thing of we're going, I just know that you're, you're that hurt and you don't know how else to go about it, mm. but I can't help you through this if you don't want to work with me on it. Mm. And then even then it's like I'm trying to be the saviour or something, so mm. I'm not sure, sorry. It's hard to crack that. <laughs> I'll give you a hug after that if you like. <laughs> I, th I think one of the things that I learned from a lot of men is when you start at what they are good at, acknowledging what they're good at, and then venture into what they're not good. Because from there, you need to neutralize the situation. And I think it work. But again, look, as a man, our society is framed in a way that is very hard for us as men to get out of it. And I'll give you a simple example. Last year, I had a one month raising money to educate girls. And I was wearing the race for for, 30, for, two mo for three months. And I rock up to events where there are 100 people uh, you know, standing up. And people who greet me normally when I come in try to look and say, what's going on with this? What the hell is going on here with this person here? It's because I'm a man, but I'm in dress. So it was sort of, and then I didn't have anything written at the, at, in front. But when I turned my back, they start coming and hug me. And because they read the history why I'm we wearing the dress. So <laughs> it's very hard for us to get out of that shadow because it's a tie to stigma. It's a tie to how we have been groomed to be tough as we are. And I think it's better to start a conversation with something that something is good at and then venture to those tough, difficult conversations. And I think it could be just maybe Watch a movie that is related to what is affecting you together, and maybe reflects on it mm -hmm. on an individual level. Yeah. Just, I mean, I'm not a clinician, but in my experience, it's just about empathy and shutting up and listening, and not presuming you know all the answers. I mean, my only experience with this is more life history interviews, biography interviews, doing with jihadi foreign fighters and terrorists and guys involved in insurgent groups, and I found I learned a lot by not presuming that I understood why they got involved in the things that they did or why they used violence the way that they did. And that often it really surprised me how they got from where they started to being involved in the Bali bombings or shooting Christians in Ambon. Those things that I, were really shocking, but the, yeah, I think it, empathy and presuming your own ignorance is really helpful, especially when you're talking about men's violence. And I think in the social work area, like as someone who studies domestic violence and teaches about it all the time, one of the things that um, I sort of keep in my brain to make myself feel better is you can have these conversations with people at a time when they're not ready to act on it, but that those things that you say, you plant that seed and it goes in their brain somewhere and stays there. and you never know what's happening with that. So um, you, you may or may not have this experience as a social worker. The people that are happy with you generally aren't the ones you hear back from. But as a professor, I have students that I taught years and years ago or people that I spoke at an event at that will contact me months and months later and say, oh, I heard what you said and later on I realized this. So. We don't have to fix everything right now. I mean, there's a whole lot of history behind all these dynamics, but all those little seeds that you plant, people are watching and they, they see, even if they don't speak out right then, they see what you're doing. And they put that away for later when they can use it. Go ahead. Question down, because I really don't do speaking in front of people well. You're um, going very well so far. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So often when I listen in on conversations surrounding masculinity, it centers around the need to redefine masculinity to suit the current social norms, ideologues, and battling you know, hazardous attributes. You know, when, when a man or woman who is capable of doing harm to others 
they're, they're not going to have a great awakening around a, a um, media lecture or a virtue signaling marketing campaign. They're most li likely an individual formed from negative experiences, i.e. trauma, neglect. So I think a more productive approach would be for us to focus on making young men and boys more secure. Because what I've noticed over my life is that the most unsafe people are incredibly insecure. So I believe that to make boys secure, they need more support in the systems that are failing them, like the, the education system. And we need to acknowledge that boys and girls, that boys aren't girls, and their learning patterns are vastly different. So how do you think we can shift the conversation to be truly productive? Thanks. I'll, I'll jump in on that one. I think this gets back to what um, Elijah was just talking about, about starting from strengths. And one of the reasons that masculinity is often experienced as quite precarious, and in fact, more precarious than femininity, because as you pointed out earlier, we don't hear people telling women how to be women. We hear them told to be ladies, which is something different. But just this focusing on the strengths that you have as an individual will make you a more secure person than defining yourself as not all these feminine things. So right now, masculinity is really based on not doing all those things that the women do, and that creates a, a sense of identity that is constantly under threat, and that's one of the main triggers of violence, this feeling of being disrespected. Um, so focusing on the strengths and defining your own attributes, the positive values that you want to embody, instead of defining yourself as not like girls or not like women or not feminine, because that does create that precarity that you're talking about. So I really like this idea of starting from strengths. David, has that been your experience too? I hope I've paraphrased correctly that, that people who are insecure are the, are the greatest risk? Um, it depends what you mean by risk. Again, this kind of comes back to... Perhaps risk in terms of da dangerous or damaging behaviour. Um, no, I mean, I would say the people that are the greatest risk of damaging and harmful behaviour are people who are very secure in very dominant positions. Again, in terms of flashy interpersonal violence that we read as being damaging, which it is, yeah, that, that's certainly the case. There's an insecurity, what Connell refers to as protest masculinity, where you have none of the material conditions to be proven as a real man, right? Like you can't get a good job, you don't have the political authority, people don't respect you because you're not educated enough, so you go hit a dude at a pub. But the, the other part of that masculinity which is really, really harmful is the kind that gaslights women and tells them that their opinions aren't real or is the, the kind that undermines other people as being failures or dangerous men because they're performing other masculinity. So I, again, I, I really bulk at these the kind of what I think of as a bit simplified accounts of what is violent or risky masculinity. And I think you need to look again. The masculinity that takes funding away from rape crisis centres is violent and dangerous. And it's more violent and dangerous on an individual level than the masculinity of an angry young guy who glasses someone. Both are bad, but we too often get preoccupied with violent masculinity which manifests from poor, brown, marginalised men and not enough from rich guys in suits who are more likely to get you killed, take away your health care, undermine your life. And in terms of the education system, I... I I kind of have a problem with the education system in a lot of ways because I think all children learn differently. Um, you know, whether someone's creative, whether someone's, um, you know, mathematical, whether someone's logical or whatever. We, we have this system where we generalise kids and we all teach them the same way when we know that all kids, whether male or female, aren't the same way. Um, so I think there's a problem with that. But if you're talking education system, I think education isn't just in the school, I think it's in what we see at the movies, I think it's what we watch in the ads, I think it's what we read in magazines. We are constantly being fed information. And the problem is, is that people don't know the difference between information and knowledge. And I think that's what we need to get back to a lot more. Nice. Okay, yes. 
Um, I was just um, considering um, Molly's comment that um, the precariousness of defining masculinity as not um, and not what females do or not what feminine things happen. Is that is it then not a coincidence that we start ha that we're having these discussions at a time when females are moving more and more into external structures outside the home um, where we are um, asking for a place at lots of different tables that traditionally have been male only. Um, is there a coincidence here that then we start asking what is it to be feminine, what is it to be masculine? Yes. <laughs> I think the reaction to that Gillette ad was hilarious and uh, not surprising. And I haven't actually watched the whole ad, but I have enjoyed reading discussions about it on Reddit, <laughs> which are just so wide ranging, such a wide variety of opinions. But yeah, certainly that's how social change happens is people get pissed off and push back and with enough velocity to force people to make a movement. That's how all social change happens. So I think for sure it takes some sort of critical mass to get things going. And I, and I guess the, 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 the progressive idea of a, that a lot of female now are, are going externally getting into big position that men used to cling on is a positive thing. And I think that's where the, the gender or the masculinity and the femin feminism become so normal. Because now f what a lot of feminist activists were looking for is an opportunity to have is the same equal acknowledgement. And I think that is a positive thing. But also on the other side, men are finding it, it's a threat to their territory. And I think it come back to that, you know, what does it mean for us to equally contribute? Because each of us got their own contribution in their own way. And I think if we acknowledge that, regardless of what gender you have, you can contribute to this society, I think this struggle between men and, and, and female will become normal because what a female can do, I can also do. And I think that will normalize everything. And it's good that a lot of men, particularly in the political environment, are now become empathetic about it. They are talking about lack of women's or lack of female representation in the, in the, in the politicals or in the parliament. And I think that is changing the narrative. But it will also help those who are very strong feminists who've been pushing the agenda and define what masculinity is, it will actually help them to slow down and say, look, they understood what we want, and I think it's right time for us to talk respectfully and honor each other and progress by taking care of everything without being gender biased. Can I just ask a quick question of the panel? Do you think there should be gender quotas in politics, Dave? Yes. Elijah? It's a tricky one for me. I'm not a fan of uh, quarters in a term, but if there's other way without allocating quarters to actually leverage and empower a lot of females to, to have more voices in our political parties, I would prefer that option. But it seems it's not working because men are still asserting their own powers. So I hope to a point of yes. Molly, should there be gender quotas in politics? Well, according to the research, they're the most effective mechanism that we know, but I think there also needs to be a gender quota on the other side about changing diapers and getting involved in those caring activities at the home because that's the other side of women moving into these public life. Now, certainly some women have always been in public life and this is a very classed and raced issue as well, right? But there's a gap that's being left, like in the housework arena, for example, where all the research studies show, oh, women are going to work now. Oh, the housework is more equitable, but let me tell you, our house is filthy because ain't nobody doing the housework. Mm -hmm. So 
There is a space for men that's been vacated by those women going out into public space, and that's at home. And I think everyone would benefit from a little bit more equality there as well. Mm. And I'd highly recommend Annabelle Crabb's book, The Wife Drought, on, on that exact issue. And, and one of the key points she makes in relation to that is that men actually want to fill some of those gaps left by the changing dynamic. It's just that, as a society, we have this expectation that men go to work and they do X, Y, and Z. So. Annabelle Crabb's book, The Wife Drought, is a, is a great read on that. Gender quotas, Stephen, in politics, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think there should be, because I think, but I think that with anything, really, um, even if it was, you know, work, a company or whatever, because I, I find that when you have that kind of, you know, and this is even just about to do with the gender thing, this is like a race thing as, as well, like with, it, you know, being an Aboriginal person. But when you open yourself up to those kind of things, then you have diversity of thinking. And why people wouldn't want to have diversity of thinking, I don't understand that. You know what I mean? Like, open your mind more. Yeah. Embrace it. And I totally agree because, and that's one of the threads that I find, uh, our diversity is not only on gender. It's, we are diverse in different ways in Australia. Uh, whether it's ethnicity or call it color of our skin and all this. And the moment we start putting quarters, we will have another movement rising up. People like me will say, I need a black fellow in the parliament. People <laughs> like indigenous will say, we need a black fellow in the parliament. <laughs> so really, it's about, the way I look at it is about seeing where the need are, where is the gap, and how can we feel that? And I think if we approach that way, and because the issue of quarter seven is not serving the interests of the ordinary people, it's always, when we do that, it's a powerful woman who will get in the position anyway. Yeah. So really, are we addressing the voices of those who are not powerful enough to be heard? That's the question, and that's always the challenge I have in my mind. Hmm. Hi there, I have a question about the role that media has in shaping masculinity, in particular pornography. Uh, we know it's easily accessible by young people. We know that young girls are presenting to hospital with internal injuries after acting out scenes with these boys who have been watching it. Uh, recently it was reported a girl now has to wear a colostomy bag because of uh, boys acting out what they've seen in pornography. It's also been described as a national crisis and I think any discussion about masculinity must address this and I'm just wondering what do you think can be done about what we're calling a national crisis? Yeah, I, I think there needs to be a lot of kind of censorship around stuff that happens on the internet. Um, you know, I've not, if you look at it, it's interesting because women will be described as you know, sluts or whores, gay men, usually faggots, poofters, African Americans, uh, thugs, uh, Latinos are like, uh, uh, sorry, African Americans are niggers, Latinos are thugs, um, and straight white men are usually studs and hunks. So, you know, I think that speaks volumes about, you know, the narrative of p pornography as well. So. Molly, how do you see the relationship between sex and violence and pornography? Well, I think that one of the things we can do to address the harms of pornography is to have better sex education and respectful relationships education in schools. And since I've been here, I've only been in Australia about seven years, but there's been a giant conversation about this. And some states are really reluctant to have those conversations about healthy relationships and sexuality. And when you're not having those, pornography is filling the void. So I think one of the ways that we can act is to have those conversations and really push for those programs that reach all the kids in the schools. David, have you, in your research, come across a, uh, any sort of correlation or connection between uh, sex, sexual violence, and, and other forms of violence? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the places that have violence have sexual violence, post-conflict spaces have a lot more sexual violence, for example. The, 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 the porn one is really interesting. I was recently in Fiji doing work on programs with men and boys encouraging gender equality and peace in sort of post-coup culture in Fiji, and one of the biggest problems they're having there is that as part of development, rural towns are now have phones and have in, um, internet access. So a bunch of young guys in contexts that are, it's quite taboo to talk about sex at all are now watching pretty 
hectic porn and don't have a context to talk about that. And there's a real challenge presented by that. And again, the racism stuff is huge. I don't think we talk about it enough when it comes to pornography, just how racist it is in the way that it objectifies and, and fetishizes certain bodies. But again, with the, the, the connection between mainstream violence and sexual violence, it's often not explicit in a, like a direct way, but you, you have this thing that gets reinforced through avenues like pornography. But the other part of that I would say is we're also a really militarized society. So not only are young boys consuming a lot of porn, they're doing what I did, which is playing a bunch of computer games and they're watching a bunch of movies that present a model of masculinity that has a gun as a surrogate dick. And that encourages a bunch of kinds of violence in really yeah, messed up ways. Mm. Okay, I think we've got about 10 minutes left, so let's go. Have we got a microphone to, yes sir. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, we've been touching on this topic a little bit so far, and I just wanted to thank that we're kind of bringing the term of intersectionality into its effects on men as well in terms of power, and I really appreciate that coming out through the discussion so far. Um, so we know from research like that of Michael Flood and the Men's Project in the Man Box study published last year that dominant constructions of masculinity are linked to poorer health outcomes for men as well as dangers for women. Um, if we accept that feminism offers a great toolkit for dismantling these effects of patriarchy, how do we equip men with these tools when feminism is so often greeted with hostility? When feminism so often... Greeted with hostility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I knew the answer to that, um, I would have already done it. <laughs> I think this is really hard. I think that uh, there's this narrative that sort of demonizes feminism and suggests that it's all about, I don't even really understand the, the anti-feminist narrative. There's this idea that it's about I don't know, reversing everything so women are in charge, and that has just never been the deal. So I think that, um, again, this is a thing that schools could go a long way to, toward acknowledging all the, like you said, intersectional, the power differences and the structural factors that reinforce inequality and oppression. Um, I know that at my university, when I arrived there, there was no course offering on domestic violence. There was just nothing. Um, so even though we have social workers, lawyers, nurses, and everything, there was no, no opportunity to learn about that as a subject area. So like, as a, as a person who teaches, I have an opportunity to build that information in and talk about structural inequality and how that affects our interpersonal lives. But. I think there's a lot of things that we can all do from where we are, and we're all in really different positions. The amount of influence that we have and over whom, I think that um, really differs for everyone. But the upside to that is, you know, there's all these negative messages coming down, but at the same time, there's so many opportunities to speak up and interrupt that. And so I think it's just about, um, I don't know that we can fix it from the top down all at once, but intervening where we can from where we are is really all we can do, I guess. I think um, part of it too is maybe looking at, you know, how masculinity is kind of wrapped up in, a, in identity. Um, you know, I, I caught a cab once and it was International Women's Day and uh, I can't remember what name he, he called it, but I said to him, you know, yeah, but if you're really a man, then that identity can't be taken from you. And he answered with, yeah, well, they can fucking try. You know, but it's kind of like when mean? protesters, you know, burned the, uh, the Australian flag. And then I heard that there was this video on YouTube where guys were burning the Aboriginal flag. So I went and watched it to see if I had any reaction to it. And I actually ended up laughing at it because they couldn't light it at first. And then so they had to pour, pour petrol on it. But I, I looked at it and it didn't upset me at all. And I realised it's because my identity is not wrapped up in that flag. My identity as an Aboriginal man is so much bigger than that piece of material. Um, and you know, it's, it's, my Aboriginal has been tried to be taken from me all my life. It's still trying to be taken from me. You know, we have an envoy for Aboriginal people who's Tony Abbott, who, you know, camped, tent, uh, camped in a tent because, you know, apparently that's how Aboriginal people live. Um, but I think we need to look at what men are wrapping that identity up in. 
um, and why there is that hostility because to me it comes from that they've got to exert some kind of power um, to show them alienness when it's really, yeah, well maybe you're looking at the wrong things that you believe make you a man. On, the, on the, the, the messaging side that you mentioned with like Michael Flood's work, one thing that I'm constantly thinking in relation to this space is that we have really low bars when we send these messages out to men like, real men don't use violence, stand up at teammates. It's too, too low, it's too low. Whereas actually I think we need to be going higher and saying other men are putting expectations of how you should be a man on you that are bad for you and you need to direct your anger not at feminism but at, for example, the male beauty industry that says you need to have a certain body or male bosses that tell you you need to work certain hours to show where you're at. And I think that we can do much more widespread and impactful work that isn't just conforming to really narrow messages about what we think will appeal to men. And instead, I think men are pretty smart and they know that masculinity hurts them. And I think the limited message of just be a better man doesn't get far enough there. So Dave, the campaigns uh, around, you know, white ribbon and, and that kind of thing, do, do you think they're ineffective? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, it's, it's not that I, I, I think that they're, they're altogether bad or, har or necessarily harmful, but I think Michael Salter's analysis of this is true, which is that they ask men who have the least power in patriarchy to change it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're asking the men who are marginalised to undo the expectation about what it means to be a man. And then at the same time, you hold up men who are already privileged, who are already in dominant positions, as ambassadors of what a real man looks like. Like it's this insane double bind where you say, you don't need to be a real man. Now look up to this rugby star and do what he does. Like it's, it's a total mind trip to me. And, and I think that the, the, these campaigns inevitably fall into this good man trap of holding up dominant, heterosexual, rich, white masculinity as the ideal and then telling people don't be bound by masculinity. Mm. Have you got a microphone? You got to have a microphone. Hi there. Um, just want to thank you for having this discussion because it's really important and it's really allowing to people to like share honesty and become more vulnerable. Um, my question is: You were discussing before how, in like the social worker question, that the way to go by it is to listen more to people to like get to the root cause of these things, and I completely agree with that. But there are those that do spread messages of toxic masculinity and like controversial figures like Jordan Peterson um, that do spread these messages that make people feel unsafe, that make men feel unsafe to be who they are. And I'm just wondering like how much of a platform do we give to those people? Like how much listening do we give to those people because we don't want to spread these messages anymore. So yeah, that's just my question. I, I think they're different questions, you know, like the, 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 quest, the context I was talking about is trying to understand how polite, friendly looking Indonesian guys were involved in funding the Bali bombing or killing Christians. I think there's a very different question of lending institutional legitimacy and authority to a figure like Jordan Peterson by giving him a lecture theatre. Mm. That, that being said, I, I get the argument for those no platforming. I'm not saying I would not be happy if my institution gave him a platform either, but I don't think in terms of social transformation, these things necessarily get undone just by cutting them out from privileged institutions. Again, that doesn't get to the heart of the issue of why they're appealing to people in the first place. I was just gonna try and look up, because Jordan Peterson was just in Brisbane, I think. Um, did oh, anyone go? Oh, he did the thing yeah? right there. Yeah. He was good? What did you learn? We're talking about toxic masculinity. I would argue that he's also a lot of toxic masculinity. And I think that's really where the fight is. He also has a good foundation for healthy masculinity. What it means to identify as a young male. And the good virtues that we can all ascribe to be strong, don't be weak, young, or stand up for yourself, mm. chase what you really want to do. Yeah. Uh, mm. I, I, Mm. I, I think, I don't know if you could hear that well, but the gentleman who went to see Jordan Peterson was saying that there's a lot of parallels in, in some of the messaging from him in terms of standing up for yourself, respecting yourself, being strong. Um, so I think that's a really important um, 
voice to include in this conversation. Yeah, can I just, I, was th I, was, I watched a couple of um, videos of stuff like his, but I, what I found interesting was he did a video where he's talking about inequality is good because it makes people want to succeed or if you're faced with it, you're, you're going to rise up. And he said, you know, because if you don't go, you either go up or down, like where else are you going to go? And I was like, well, you go out. <laughs> Like, and that was that thing for that diversity of thinking. And I think, I don't know if he's exposed himself, I think, to enough of that. And there is some stuff he says, you know, that is, that is really good. But then there's other two things too where I think it's also that kind of, um, he's kind of based it all on this one way of thinking. And it's often when I even when I sit around and watch philosophy videos, I will watch a lot of things and I go, man, there's such a lot of this, the way that Aboriginal people think that is, that is missing from this. And, you know, when people even talk about what does it mean to be human? Um, and they talk about the shadow and the beast and, and that kind of stuff and, you know, searching within yourself. And that's the thing where I go back to, see, because when Aboriginal people, when we talk, we talk about it as a collectiveness. And so if one of our mob is sick, we're all sick. That's why, you know, even with domestic violence, with all that kind of stuff, with, you know, whatever's happening within Aboriginal communities, we all suffer because of that. Um, and so where was I going? With? Oh yeah, and so then even when we talk about the shadow and the beast, that's what I was thinking, like, because the world doesn't think in a collective sense, they're not even realising that we're already seeing the rising of the shadow and the beast, that it's happening in the world. We have that happening now. So, um, so yeah, he says some good things, but that's what I was just thinking about. He, there's that diversity of thinking, too, that I think he could, could learn about. But just to also answer your question, too, I just wanted to point out that with my mate before, we have a, we have a lot of discussions, and really big ones, about the one with the man-sized tissue. Um, but every time we finish our discussions, it's always like, I love you, brother. So we always reassert that at the end. So we can have things where we totally disagree. And I think that's another thing that's kind of even missing from the world today. And, and I get why people, you know, there's a lot of outrage and stuff like that, because there should be. But I think at the same time, we aren't forgiving enough. And I think sometimes if someone stuffs up, we'll go, oh, let's, yeah, get rid of them, da, 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 don't give them a second chance. And it's like, well, hold up. How about giving them a second chance, and then if they stuff up again, then maybe we, you know what I mean? So I, I just think there's even that when we have those discussions, people need to be ready to listen, um, but also people need to be ready to be told. But I think we need to understand too that it's okay to disagree on some things, unless you know, you're kind of a politician and you're in charge of people's lives. <laughs> um, you know, then people really need to listen if they're in those kind of things. But, yeah, I just think it needs to go back to that thing again about even, like, you know, respect for the self, but respect for others as well. Ladies and gents, I reckon that's a really good note for us to wrap up on tonight. And I don't know if we've gone up or down. Are you desperate? Is it a really great final question? No pressure. Okay. Go on then. And I'm actually tempted by Elijah, uh, by Elijah's story. Hold your mic to your mouth, yep. Sorry. That's right. Um, I am questioning and wondering whether the role of male and female, which is often controlled by religion, um, and the reporting of, and the honesty of the reporting of, comes back to power, male, female. So I'll give you a little bit of an example. About 40 years ago, I found myself in a country somewhere in the Arabian Gulf where I was having a business. I found myself in a lift in a building which was the Sharia court. I can see you smiling. I had a piece of paper in my hand. I was a blonde woman, light eyes. I had a piece of paper in my hand which was in Arabic which sent me up somewhere to the third or fourth floor where I was meant to see somebody. I had in this lift also a very fierce looking mullah in the thobe. We both looked at each other in fear, but I went up to do what I had to do. And what it said in this particular uh, document that I was allowed to trade like an honorable man, because in Arabic there was no such thing as being able to trade as an honorable woman. The, the, the thing that I took away from that is that as Elijah says, if you treat each other's differences with respect and knowledge and kindness and not with violence, I didn't take objection to the fact that I was an honorable man because I was actually given the freedom to 
conduct my life in a, in a way that was unknown, but I did. And I did not challenge him for, for his looks, for not wanting to stand too near to me, which is fine. We were respectful of each other. So that brings me to another thing, which is... You got to... Oh, you, you, remember, okay. you're the last question, question, question of the question, night. Question, you're the climax. Okay. okay. The is there a question? Okay, the we can yeah. take it as a, as a comment, as an observation. The, 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 the question that is coming, that at the moment, this is 40 years ago, what I now notice about stirring up with male and female roles is the power of the press and their reporting and whose hand that is in. What can we do about it? Because that tends to be white, male, funded by money, that really has results to suit their needs, not necessarily the needs of what is necessary. It, it, Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll take it. We'll, we'll finish it because we do. We do need to finish. Sorry to our panelists tonight because I know we do absolutely, and I, and I think tonight we you know we did talk about the positive all of the aspects of, of masculinity. I'm going to wrap it up, ladies and gentlemen, and I and I think I imagine that our panelists may well be happy to, to chat to you, sir, and I hope that you did take some things away from tonight because I don't think it was a necessarily a damning indictment on what it is to be a man, and I think to paraphrase. Mr. Stephen Oliver tonight, uh, uh, whether or not we've gone up or down, I hope that we've gone out tonight because that would be a very, a very good outcome. I'll get you to thank Stephen Oliver, Molly Dragowitz, Elijah Bull, and David Jury-Smith, and to you as well. Thank you very much.